Last week I said that we would be faced and that, that many of us need to be prepared in the next 20 years to be threatened to lose our job if we're clear about what we believe. If you weren't, if you weren't with us last week, I encourage you to go back and listen to the message. But I said that in the next 20 years that we need to be prepared to be threatened to lose our jobs if we we're clear about what we believe. And maybe I should have said in the next 20 days that we needed to be prepared to lose our jobs if we were going to be clear about what we believe. Or, or maybe I should have said in the next 20 minutes that we need to be prepared, that if we're going to be clear about what we believe, we need to be prepared to lose our jobs. Um, Anthony Bass was a pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays, a good pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays. And last month, he reposted on his social media a post uh, promoting the boycott, uh, kind of the boycott that's going on uh, for Target, for pushing um, an ideology um, of uh, affirming kids to pursue a, a, a gay sexuality and a gay identity in their clothing and pushing that out in the stores. Um, and he reposted uh, a post that was talking about uh, affirming and promoting the boycott against Bud Light uh, for using a trans individual as their spokesperson and as one who would push out their product. And so he reposted a post on his social media that was affirming the boycott against Target and against Bud Light. And then within like 24 hours or so, he took the post down, not exactly sure what was going on, but then he was on the news making an apology. So you can kind of read between the lines and you can kind of imagine what did the Toronto Blue Jays do to twist his arm, to pressure him, about his job to say you've got to make a public statement apologizing for what you just promoted. Indeed, his post, what he said in, in the repost was um, that, what, that what Target was doing and that what Bud Light was doing was evil and demonic. That's what he said about it. Spoke very, he spoke very clearly about what he believed on his own personal social media platform. And then within 24, 36 hours, then he's now making an apology for what he said said, here's the apology if you missed it, here's, here's what he said. I recognize yesterday uh, I made a post that was hurtful to the Pride community, which includes friends of mine and close family members of mine, and I am truly sorry for that. Um, I just spoke with my teammates took them, shared with them my actions yesterday, and I apologize with them. And as of right now, I'm using the Blue Jays resources to better educate myself, to make better decisions moving forward. Uh, the ballpark is for everybody. Uh, we include all fans at the ballpark, and we, and we want to welcome everybody. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I rec- Post about what he believes about sexuality. He takes it down and then seemingly uh, has his arm twisted to make this apology. And then after he makes this a public apology, the Toronto Blue Jays designate him for assignment. Now, if you don't know baseball terminology, let me explain to you what that means. When a player is designated for assignment, essentially it means that the Blue Blue Jays can trade Bass in the next seven days, and if they don't, they can place him on irrevocable outright waivers where he will be released, let go, terminated from his job with the Blue Jays, um, or picked up by another team. Amazing. He speaks what he believes. His employer twists his arm and gets an apology, and then they let him go. And last week I said we need to be prepared in the next 20 years for exactly what happened this past week with Anthony Bass. As we're studying Ephesians together, we see that the Apostle Paul is talking about spiritual warfare. He's talking about spiritual warfare, and we see everywhere in front of us, the realities of spiritual warfare. I hope that you'll find your way to Ephesians chapter 6 and pick up in verse 13 with me. Um, Church, it's so important that you see with your eyes what 
the sacred scriptures say, more important than you hear what I have to say about them. So I invite you to take a Bible on your phone or a Bible there in the chairs or your own personal Bible and look with your eyes at the sacred scriptures to see what God has said to us. Ephesians chapter 6. Let's read a little bit about what the Holy Spirit said through Paul as he wrote to the Ephesian Christians. Verse 13. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Would you pray with me? Father, we pray, speak to us now personally, powerfully, through your sacred scriptures. Shape us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm titling the sermon this morning, Stand on the Snake with Our Savior. And as we look at the reality of spiritual warfare, I want to draw your attention to a couple of things before we begin to unpack the armor of God. And the first thing that I want to direct your attention to is found in verse 16. Look at verse 16 with me. In all circumstances... Take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Paul says, in all circumstances. As a pastor, this probably doesn't surprise you, but from time to time people will come to me, and something will be happening in their life, something will be happening in a friend or a family member or in a situation, and they'll come up to me with the question of, do you think that's spiritual warfare? Yes. And then something else will happen, and they'll come up to me and It's heightened their senses of spiritual activity. And they'll come to me and they'll be like, do you think that's spiritual warfare? Yes. What what we see in this text is that all of life is spiritual warfare. Listen, when you go to a third world country where it's common, where we see demon possession, then everybody in those communities and in those tribes and in those countries, all of those people know and understand that all of life is spiritual warfare because they see physical manifestations daily of spiritual warfare. In North America, much of the warfare that we've experienced is that the enemy has caused the church to be asleep. The enemy has caused the church to be in a spiritual coma. Therefore, when something happens that heightens our spiritual faculties, we go, is that spiritual warfare? Listen, every breath you take is spiritual warfare. Every day you live is spiritual warfare. Now, let me bring you some good news. Our victory has been won. So another thing, and this may not surprise you, maybe you've experienced this or maybe you've been the person, as, some, as people begin to talk about spiritual warfare, you get a little weirded out by it. It's a little mysterious. People are afraid of the things that they, the the unknown. And what I find often are that Christians are ill-equipped to understand spiritual warfare, and as a result, they're afraid of it. And it's my hope today that you'll walk out those doors when you leave with a better understanding of the nature of spiritual warfare, and you won't be afraid of spiritual warfare another moment in your life because you'll understand that the battle has been won. The enemy, Satan, a fallen angel, tempts Adam and Eve, and sin and death and chaos come into the world. And now he rules this air with his demons, quote, rules this air with his demons. But he creeps around, as 1 Peter 5 tells us, he prowls around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. But let's get a couple of things straight about the nature of, of the devil in the spiritual warfare that we experience from him. The first thing that you, you need to understand, let me just give you a couple of analogies. Have you ever seen like a gunfight in an old western? Do you know what I'm talking about? Maybe you've seen like a modern movie that has a gunfight and two people have guns and maybe they're, you know, walking it off. One, two, three, when they hit the, you know, boom, they're firing or, or whatever it is. Sometimes in a gunfight, somebody gets shot. And they get shot in the place that's going to lead to their imminent death. And they're laid out on the ground, and sorry for the graphic imagery, they're laid out on the ground, 
They're bleeding out. They're about to die, but they still have a gun in their hand. And as they're dying, they fire a shot to, to, to try to bring death to someone else while they're dying. Another imagery might be like this. You've got a house, and the house is on fire, and it has a second floor, and there's a window, and you're in battle against an enemy, and they're looking out through the window. Do I have any Fortniters in the room? In the room? Anybody? I know. Yeah, I'm late to the party. I'm late to the Fortnite party, kiddos. All right? But just imagine a house in Fortnite, and it's going up in flames, but there's an enemy looking out the window, and he's got a gun, and in a matter of seconds, he's going to be wiped out because he's in the house, and there's no chance of him making it. But as he's about to die in the flames, he's still firing off. I think probably the best example and illustration is that of a snake. Have you ever killed a snake? Come on, somebody. Anybody ever killed a snake? All right, I see you. This is the moment that you're like, yeah, I killed a snake. Want to see the picture? (laughs) Anybody? Come on. Yeah, all right. How many snakes have you killed? You ever killed a snake? If you've killed a poisonous snake, what you don't do is, like, pick it up. Kids, look at the poisonous snake. If you know what's right, because even though a snake may be cut in half, practically dead, there's still poison in its fangs. Listen to me. Jesus Christ, through his life, sinless, perfect fulfillment of God's righteous law, through his death, his substitutionary atonement for sinners like you and me, through his burial and through his resurrection, he has conquered Satan. The war is over. The serpent has been cut in two. He has no hope, no chance, and the Lord Jesus will throw him in the pit of hell one day. And he's flopping around like a snake cut in half, but he still has poison in his fangs. This is spiritual warfare. You have the victory in Jesus Christ. But the devil wants to try to destroy you on his own way to his own destruction. That's spiritual warfare. The devil's down. Jesus has won. On the cross, he cried out, it is finished. It's finished. The Lord Jesus went to war on Satan, on our sin, and he won. And it's only a matter of time that that snake that's been cut in half quits flopping. And the poison is forever removed from his fangs. But be sure of this right now. That serpent who's on his way to death, wants to get you in his fangs. Even though he's destroyed, he wants to destroy on his own way to destruction. This is what Paul's unpacking, and this is what you need to understand. Spiritual warfare is Satan's last-ditch effort to destroy even as he is headed to destruction. Did you hear that? Somebody write that down. Somebody yell amen. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say the war is over. Somebody say I have victory in Jesus. Spiritual warfare is Satan's last ditch effort to destroy even as he is headed to destruction. The apostle Paul, as he unpacks these images of the armor of God, we like to focus on the specific images and get fired up about the nature of the images, and that's well and good, and we should because he's speaking in a way that people would have understood as he's talking about the the garb of perhaps a a Roman soldier and the shield and and the belt and all these things. But understand, he's actually reaching back to the Old Testament and he's picking up on images that the prophet Isaiah used in talking about Jesus. So look at this with me, or just listen rather, Ephesians 11. We'll get, to, uh, we'll get to Ephesians 6 in a moment. This is Isaiah 11. I know I'm going too fast. I went like way too long. I'm trying to get it in a little shorter this service, all right? Isaiah 11, 4 through 5, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, and he will slay the wicked righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist Isaiah 59 17 he put on righteousness as a breastplate you hear the language and the helmet of salvation on his head 
who is Isaiah talking about? He's talking about what Jesus is going to do. And he, he's talking about it in past tense because it's as good as done. Jesus is going to execute the Father's plan. Make no mistake. Isaiah 59, verse 17, he put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in a zeal as in a cloak. Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful on the mountains of the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Paul didn't come up with the armor of God on his own. Paul understood the Old Testament. He understood what Isaiah was talking about Jesus. That's why it's called the armor of God. It's Jesus' armor. Jesus showed up in righteousness, living a righteous life. Jesus showed up as the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no one comes to the Father except by me. I am the truth. That's what Jesus said. He said that after Isaiah said he was going to come with the breastplate of righteousness and a belt of righteousness. Oh, when you, listen, the, the Bible is so rich and deep. You can have a real, you can have your life changed by the Holy Scriptures with a little, small, little, tiny, little introductory understanding of the gospel. The Spirit of God can change your life with just the, the tiniest little understanding of the gospel. And He can forever change your life by the inexhaustible riches of the sacred scriptures. It's just something fresh and new every time I open the, the Word of God. This is why we call it the armor of God. It's because Jesus has won the victory against Satan. He lived this perfect life. The devil tempted Jesus. But Jesus resisted at every point. In his death, he paid the penalty for sin brought into the world by the devil's temptation. Through his resurrection, he overcame the devil's attempt to bring destruction. But the devil's still prowling around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. Paul's singular message to the church in this text is one word, stand. Stand. Don't lay down, don't roll over, don't walk away, don't flinch, stand. This is a good message for our church, isn't it? It's a good message for the North American church living in a culture that, that hates the truth of God in many aspects. Because if we go with the flow of the culture, we'll roll over, we'll walk away, we'll flinch every time. But we're soldiers in Christ. To hear this, this text is about the armor of God that we're to put on. And as we put it on, we're standing. And what are we standing in? We're standing in the victory that is already ours because of what Jesus has accomplished. When I was a kid, I struggled understanding the armor of God because I hear all these amazing images and I would see all these great pictures. Look at this picture. Can we throw up the soldier up here? I would see all these great images, and I would be like, whoa. And then I would hear the Scripture say, put on the armor of God. And I'm like, how? And I would hear these images, and I, how, how, do I, how do I do that? Listen, the simple way that you put on the armor of God is by receiving it by faith. That's how you put it on. You slow your mind down. You slow your heart down. You fix your eyes upon Jesus you understand the promises of God. You understand the clear teaching of the gospel. And you believe it by faith. And when you believe the gospel by faith, the armor is on you. It's on you. In other words, the armor isn't this like heavy-to-lift metal thing that if you're really, 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 really spiritual, you'll get the breastplate of righteousness on. No, 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 no. You put on the armor of, of God. Of God. It's God's armor. Let's, let's look at it with, let's look at it together. Well, first, we're to stand for truth. Look at verse 14. Verse 14, the first part of it. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. You know what I don't get these days? I don't get why kids wear pajamas to school. Anybody with me? Like, like, I get it, like on pajama day, everybody wears pajamas, right? I get it. But, man, when you drop your kids off and you see, and you're like, is it pajama day? Did you miss it? No, that's just what they wear, right? I don't get that. I'm like, no, put some clothes on to go to school. You know what I mean? It's like, be prepared for whatever the occasion that you're on. The belt of truth, this is what it was. Like, the wear, the guard, the, 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 what, what a soldier would have worn, what, what any modern-day person would have, what, what any ancient person would have worn would have been like lounge clothes, like your, like your uh, pajamas. 
And when they're ready to stop lounging, they tighten up their belt. And it brings the flowing garment up tight, and they're ready for battle. That's what it means to fasten the belt of truth. So, so how, do you, how do you fasten the belt of truth? Because I know sometimes when I'm a little overweight, it's hard to get that buckle buckled. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's not always easy to buckle my belt. You, some of you know what I'm talking about. You didn't even wear a belt this morning because you couldn't get it buckled, right? Sorry. I'm sorry. That was too much. Sorry. Sorry. Gluttony is a sin. Lord, help us, right? Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. So is obsessing about your image, right? God, we just, we're, we're like, we are messed up people, aren't we? Aren't you glad that Jesus does not give up on molding and making us? Okay, Lord. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the truth. So when you trust in Jesus, you're tightening the belt of truth on you. And you're ready for battle. You're ready for battle. But that's all I got to do? Trust in Jesus? <laughs> Trusting in the King of kings, the Son of God, the great I am, the eternal God who had no beginning and no end and upholds the universe by the word of his power, who comes to live inside of you by his spirit when you trust in him? Yeah, that prepares you for battle. And that's all you got to do. Truth. Truth. Stand for truth. You receive truth and stand for truth. You stand covered in his righteousness. Look at 14b. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. I love this image of a breastplate of righteousness because it's like take a shot. You know what I mean? Take, just take a shot. When I was younger and my kids were younger, I'd say, hit me in the chest, right? Don't do that any, you know, anymore. But just hit me in the chest, right? Because I felt like I could handle it, right? It's like a modern-day bulletproof vest where you can take a bullet and you're fine. That's what this breastplate of righteousness was. It covered up the heart. It covered up the lungs. And here's what you need to understand about it. When you trusted in Jesus, he didn't only forgive you of your sin. What do you mean only? That sounds like a pretty good deal. All my sins washed away. That's not all he did. He also declared you righteous. How could he do that? Jesus fulfilled God's law perfectly. He was righteous. When he was on the cross, God treated him like we deserved. He bore our sins on the cross so God could treat us like Jesus deserved, righteous. God declared Jesus guilty for our sin on the cross so he could declare you and me not guilty, righteous. So you're like, I don't feel righteous. That's okay. You don't have to. The Christian life is a life lived by faith, not by feelings. We'll see that more here in, in a minute. This is amazing. Why is, why is this so important? Why does this matter tomorrow morning? Anybody looking forward to work tomorrow morning? I hope you are. But I know some of you got lame jobs with lame bosses, and it's a dread. I get it. I was late to Starbucks once when I was working there. And I was late and I was driving really fast, so I got pulled over by a cop. We were opening the store, had to be there at like 4.30. I came in and my supervisor just cursed me up and down. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You roll into work Monday morning, and the enemy begins his work of deception, accusing you. Accusing you. What you did, that's who you are, look at where you're headed. What you did, see, you're not worth anything. See, you said, you told your family you were serious about spirituality. You even got baptized. Look at what you did. Look at, that's what the enemy does. He accuses you. He, he speaks lies to you about who you are, about your worth, about your identity, about about your value. He haunts you with your past. And when you trust in Jesus, you take on a breastplate of righteousness that is impenetrable to the devil's accusation. Bing, bing, bing. The devil can't do anything to you with his accusations because Jesus has clothed you with his righteousness. Listen, it's going to take a lifetime for some of us to get that into our head and heart. We're declared righteous. Declared righteous. Declared righteous. Let's put to death the lies of the enemy that says anything other than I am the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. <laughs> he made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might become the very righteousness of God in him. 
Stand in and ready to share the gospel of peace. Look at verse 15 with me. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Friends, listen, there's nothing in this life that can give you peace but Jesus. Everybody looks for it in everything else. And everybody makes up in their mind all these things that they think that they're going to have. If my spouse would just do this, I would have peace. If my boss would just do this, I would have peace. If I could get this promotion, if I could make this money, if my, you know, if my investments would do a little better, I would have peace. No, it would. No, it won't. No, it won't. But the Lord Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And when he takes up residence in your heart, he gives you a peace that passes all understanding. What does that mean? That means the peace is so unspeakably good, you don't even have words adequate to describe how good the peace is that Jesus will give you. Listen, friends, if you need that kind of peace, Jesus says, come. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Peace. It's peace. Why, why would you say no to that? Pride. Pride. Some of you are saying no to that peace today. Jesus offers it to you, and you say, no thanks, I'm going to go try to find it on my own in all these other places. That's insanity. That's insanity. King Jesus will give you peace. When you trust in him, you receive this peace. And then what happens is your heart is such at peace, then you become one that tells everybody else about this peace that they can have. Right? It's like, why would you hang on to this peace and not tell others about how they can have this peace? Listen, your friends and my friends and I mean, like, everybody's, like, angst. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like just all the angst. It's like the word self-care is, like, the most popular word of 2022, you know? Like, self-care. Listen, you don't have to obsess over self-care when you got the king of kings caring for you because he gives you peace. You can do others' care. <laughs> I mean, that's what Philippians 2 says, right? Jesus considered equality with God something not to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, becoming the servant of others, becoming obedient even to, the, obedient to death on a cross. You can die to yourself because you have peace in your heart given to you by the king of kings who squashed Satan on the cross and through his resurrection. You can obsess over others' care. <laughs> Don't give me that self-care garbage. Jesus cared for you. Be wise. Don't become a workaholic. Love your family well. Don't, don't hear something I'm not saying. It's just that the values in, in the messages that this world tells us are so contrary to the truth of the gospel. Peace is ours in Christ. Put the shoes on. Put the shoes on. I love this. Stand shielded by faith. I love this. Verse 16, look at it with me. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. I love these shields. This is actually an accurate representation of the shields that, that a soldier would have carried in that day. It wasn't like a little small round shield. It was four foot tall shield cover their whole body and then it wrapped around so that like arrows couldn't come in from the enemy it's, so like not only was it for defense it was for offense because hello I've got a shield you can't touch me I'm marching forward with the mission of Jesus do you see it I love these shields they had a, a leather covering on the outside that would be soaked in water so that when an arrow that was lit on fire would be shot the fiery arrow couldn't burn the shield up we got a shield like that it's called faith. It's called faith. I don't know who sold you a Christianity that said it's all about what you feel. Listen, I love when the Lord feels near. But what you feel about his nearness doesn't matter. What he promises about his nearness does. The Christian faith is faith. It's not about what you feel. Some of you think you're the authority and whether or not you feel that he's close, that's the determination. No, trust his word, what he says. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord, Romans 8. Nothing. Nothing can separate you. Well, don't feel close to him. Why do you let your feelings be the authority for your life? Let the word of God be the authority for your life. And trust him. Take him at his word. He's a good father. 
He's going to fulfill his promises. The, the war is won. The enemy's flopping around. Just don't let the fangs get in you. But celebrate. The victory is yours in Christ. Hallelujah. Stand shielded by faith. We receive Christ by faith. We receive him. We live by faith. We overcome temptation by faith. Paul's goal in talking about spiritual warfare is that we wouldn't stop having faith. How, how do you put on the armor of God? As a kid, I couldn't understand it by faith. So, so you mean I've got the belt of truth on when I have faith? Yes. So you mean I actually have the breastplate of righteousness when, I, when my faith is in Jesus? I actually have that, that breastplate on me? Yes. You mean I have a shield that's protecting me from the enemy? Yes, when your faith is in Jesus. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Isn't that so good? <laughs> you don't have to go find the materials for this armor. You don't have to paint the armor. You don't have to put the armor together. Jesus did it all. Just put it on. Receive it. Receive it. Stand for truth. Stand covered and in his righteousness, stand in and ready to share the gospel of peace. Stand shielded by faith. Stand secure in your salvation. Look at 17, verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation. Love that helmet. <laughs> Take the helmet of salvation. Earlier in Ephesians, Paul said we are saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest no man should boast. So if you can lose your salvation, then you can do something to earn it again, and then you can brag about it. That's not the way it works. It's a gift to be received when you're adopted into the family of God. You're forever a child of God. And God's the most faithful father to discipline his children. And if you're not living like it, but you belong to him, he will discipline you in his love, and you'll be a prodigal one day. And the angels will rejoice. Stand secure in your salvation. If your salvation is dependent upon you, there's no security in that. But if your salvation is dependent upon what Jesus did, there's lots of security in that. Because <laughs> he came back from the dead. Stand secure in your salvation and, and then finally stand with the sword in hand and heart. Look at verse, the, the next part of 17b. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is what's so amazing, is that when you receive Jesus, the Spirit of God comes into your life, and He just begins to tattoo God's Word all over your heart. The, the psalmist says it this way in Psalm 119. The first sermon I ever preached was from Psalm 119, verse 9, 10, and 11. How does a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The sword of the Spirit. He's, he's put it on your heart. And then you get to hide it in your heart. And then you become a fierce warrior for Jesus. Friends, can I just tell you, if you memorize one small little Scripture, you hide it in your heart, shoo, you're going to be such a threat to the enemy. You're going to be such a threat to the enemy because when he starts tempting you, you're going to have his wor the word stored up in your heart and you're going to slice him up with the sword. And your coworker, or your family member, or your friend, they're discouraged. And it's not your word and you didn't come up with it, you just hid it in your heart. But when they need it most, you've got it on your lips and you just slice up the devil with the sword. You just keep chopping him in half. That's what the Word of God does. This charge to stand is both a command and a promise. Don't miss that. It's a command to stand, but it's a promise that when you trust in Jesus, the belt is on, the breastplate is on, the shield is up, the sword is in your hand, the shoes are on. That's what Jesus does. He clothes you. He equips you. He doesn't leave you hanging. He doesn't say go figure it out on your own. He says, I am sufficient. My grace is sufficient. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So it's, it's a command to be strong, but it's also a promise that if we really put on the full armor of God, we slow down and by faith receive it, we will stand and we will be, be victorious. We are fully equipped. 
we're fully equipped. Um, the, um, I asked earlier, anybody killed a snake? I, I know you weren't ready for that, and some of your, you know, some of your wives were elbowing. This is your moment, you know. Tell the church family you killed a snake. So I'll give you a do-over. Anybody killed a snake? You know what I love? You know what? You know what I love? I love this moment when Dad has killed the snake, and he's just standing on it. A snake's done, chopped up. Dad's got his foot on the snake. Snake's not going anywhere. Done. And then he says, hey, son, you want to stand on the snake with me? You want to you stand on the snake with me? And I, and I feel like a lot, sometimes the church is like the timid, scared little son not sure. Not sure. And I just want to tell you, church, let's stand on the snake with our Savior. You're equipped. You got everything you need. You got everything you need. The battle feels too great for you, but you're equipped. Sword of the Spirit, belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, peace on your feet. What else do you need? Jesus has given you all you need for the victorious life in Christ. Put on the armor of God. Reckon it true. Slow down. Take time. Reckon it true in your mind. You're more than, you are more than a conqueror through Christ who loved you. So we started this morning looking at Anthony Bass. And to be clear, Anthony has come back and he said, he said publicly now, I, I still believe what I believe. Like he's kind of, you know, I, I kind of feel bad for the guy because he probably did not realize after one social media post he was going to be thrust in the limelight like that and, and have, be pressured by the Toronto Blue Jays. And, and now here, here he is like without a job. And um, now he's got an opportunity to stand. Every day is an opportunity to stand. Now he's got an opportunity to stand with the peace that Jesus gives him. He lost his job, but pieces available for this man. Um, but I got to tell you, I, I saw this video that many of you saw, these amazing vol, uh, softball players from Oklahoma University. You know who I'm talking about, these amazing women. And um, here's a great picture of these women who have put on the armor of God. Watch this with me. Barbara with ESPN, for, for the players, I know you talked about keeping the joy of the game, but I'm curious, it's a long season, right? And you guys have had the target on your back the entire time the win streak being number one. How do you handle the unique pressure that comes with that? How do you keep the joy for so long when anxiety seems like a thing that could very easily set in? Well, the only way that you can have a joy that doesn't fade away is from the Lord. And any other type of joy is actually happiness that comes from circumstances and outcomes. And um, I think Coach has said this before, but joy from the Lord is really the only thing that can keep you motivated, um, uh, just in a good mindset, uh, no matter the outcomes. Thankfully, we've had a lot of success this year, but if it was the other way around, uh, joy from the Lord is the only thing that can keep you embracing those memories, moments, friendships, and all of that. So uh, I would, that's really the only, the only answer to that because there's no other way that softball can bring you that um, because of how much failure comes in it and just how much of a roller coaster the game can be. 1,000%. Agree with Grace Lyons. Um, I went through that my freshman year. I I was so happy to win the college. I've talked about this before, but I was just so happy that we won the College World Series. But I didn't feel joy. I didn't have. I didn't know what to do the next day. I didn't know what to do for that following week. I didn't feel filled, and I had to find Christ in that. And I think that is what makes our team so strong. Is that. We're not afraid to lose because if it's not the end of the world if we do lose. Yes, obviously we've worked our butts off to be here and we want to win, but it's not the end of the world because our life is in Christ and that's all that matters. Yeah, um, I think a huge thing that we've really just latched onto is eyes up. And you guys mm -hmm. see us doing this and pointing up, but we're really like fixing our eyes on Christ. And that's something where... 
like they were saying, you can't find a fulfillment in an outcome, whether it's good or bad. And um, I think that's why we're so steady in what we do and, and our love for each other and our love for the game, because we know this game is giving us the opportunity to glorify God. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think once we figured that out and that was our purpose and everyone was all in with that, um, it's really changed so much for us. And I mean, I know myself, I, I've seen so much of a growth in myself with um, once I turned to Jesus and I realized how he had changed my outlook on life, not just softball, but understanding how much I have to live for, and that's living to exemplify the kingdom. And I think that brings so much freedom. And I'm sure everyone's story is similar, but we all have those great testimonies that have really like shown how awesome it is to play for something bigger. Um, and I think that's just what brings me so much joy. And no matter the outcome, whether we get a trophy in the end or not, we're, this isn't our home. And I think that's what's amazing about it is we have so much more. We have an eternity of joy with our Father, and I'm so excited about that. And, yes, I live in the moment, but I know this isn't my home. And um, no matter what, my sisters in Christ will be there with me in the end um, when we're with our, our King. So, Patty, uh, you've got to keep your... Come on, church. Come on. Let's shine like that. Let's put the armor of God on. Let's believe. Let's receive it. Would you just stand to your feet? Would you, would you close your eyes right now as you stand to your feet? And I just want you to imagine something in, in your mind. I just want you to see. Go, close your eyes. Just imagine this with me. See the helmet of salvation. Can you just see a, a helmet of gold going on your head? Can you imagine? Can you just see? This, this strong breastplate of righteousness over your chest. Can you see it? Can you see this belt at your waist preparing you for battle? Can you see these shoes of peace on your feet? Can you see this four-foot high shield? Can you see it? All right, look at me, church. You're equipped. You got this. Shine bright. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's stand on the serpent with our Savior this week. Right on? You with me? Come on, let's sing. Let's